Hello everyone, you're tuned into today's PIR live event and I'm your host Scott Jones. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce our guest today, Dr. Nadine Robinson. Dr. Robinson is a freelance writer and an assistant professor at Algoma University. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Robinson. Thank you. This is uh, my first talk through Partners in Research, so I'm uh, excited to uh, try this out. And so take it easy on me, folks. It's the uh, first time. Okay, great. I'm going to share my PowerPoint presentation and then give you a little talk which I've labeled uh, Ghana, question mark. But here we go. Great. So uh, before you do that, I'll just uh, welcome our live stream viewers and uh, remind them that they can tweet their questions to the hashtag AskPIR anytime during the talk today, and then I'll relay them to our guests during the question and answer period. Uh, please, as always, include in your tweet your name, school, or city, and we'll give you a shout out. So I'll get to those questions in a moment, but first I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Robinson. Okay, so can you see the slide? Yes, I can. All right. So I called my talk today Dot Map because of a famous uh, marketing campaign called Got Milk. So why not steal from the best, especially because today's talk is talking about uh, math in marketing. And uh, I've also thrown in math in my life because frankly, um, I use math every day. So onto the cheesy pun part of the presentation, uh, suffice it to say that math absolutely has added to my quality of life. It has subtracted uncertainty and fear from decision making and it multiplies opportunities for fun and uh, I can guarantee you that. So now that the uh, puns are done with, let's keep going. Who am I? Uh, I'm Dr. Nadine Robinson, as Scott mentioned, and I went to Lee Collegiate High School in uh, Ottawa and I was in the gifted program there. I hear we've got some uh, peeps of mine potentially online right now. Uh, then I went on to the University and uh, University of Ottawa following a business program. Spent over a decade in uh, business and uh, have been called a social media guru along the way. And I've got another title of best-selling author and I also teach at Algoma University up in Sault Ste. Marie. So uh, when we talk about numbers in my life, I completed a doctorate in business administration and you can't complete a doctorate without producing new research. So for me, I did mine at Athabasca University and focused on consumer behavior and using statistics to prove and uh, a new model understanding consumer complaint behavior and of course couldn't do that without math. And while I'm teaching, I teach a variety of subjects, both qualitative and quantitative, marketing, statistics, different business courses, finance, economics, whatever's going, but everything has a math component. Uh, in terms of my career, <clears throat> I've, uh, I started out in accounting and went on to high tech and international development and academia and basically worked in all facets of business in Mexico, <clears throat> Argentina and in Canada. One thing that was uh, a constant throughout was that I had to do hundreds of PowerPoint presentations, all with numbers, hundreds of market-based decisions that couldn't have happened without market release research using correlation, regression, um, a simple survey technique, and reporting on the effectiveness of promotions. Because, well, your boss always wants to know, well, how to go. And that included understanding financial statements and being able to uh, work with the ratios and uh, know how those statements are built. And it's even little things, like when you go into a store, is the store measuring how much the average sales basket is? Because there's an old adage in management and in business that says you, you can't manage what you don't measure. So uh, you need to look at these numbers and measure them 
in order to know if you're doing as well as you'd like to be doing. And that's a photo of me getting an award for some uh, writing that I've done along the way. So yeah, I said I was also a best-selling author, and uh, I wrote a book for this TV celebrity called Man Tracker. And um, maybe you want to ask me how I use break-even analysis for uh, coming up with the decision to actually turn down a publisher and self-publish on our own. Or um, the other side of things is I do a lot of freelance writing and uh, have used simple things like knowing how to do percentage change properly to um, distinguish myself as a writer and basically show people up, including uh, some city officials who may not have calculated their numbers correctly and are making decisions erroneously. Uh, then, of course, there's also my career on the web and uh, when we do marketing campaigns online, you're all on Facebook, so am I, you can find me later. But the campaigns are always priced on one of two ways. And it's called something uh, pay-per-click or pay-per-view. And basically, your pricing um, depends on the outcomes you want. And again, of course, math comes into those decisions. Uh, and yeah, I've got uh, Survivor Man up there too. I ran a big event for him up in Horn Pain with a bunch of NHL players. And one of the reasons I was up there was because I was doing all the fundraising and uh, the budgeting for that event. But a career isn't just the degrees we acquire and it's not just the jobs we've had or held. Um, life for me is uh, based on passion and I am very passionate about life and believe that your money should only be spent on things that can't be taken from you like education, travel and life experiences and I try and live my life with that in mind so at one point I was finishing my doctorate writing a book teaching part-time, and raising two children. So time management comes into it too. That one's not a math one. But basically, um, I've done a lot of amazing things, including traveling to 39 countries, scuba diving with hammerhead sharks, uh, base jumping in Utah. And these are things you can't do unless you uh, basically pay to play. And if you don't budget your money properly, you can't go on all these crazy adventures, as my friends always call them, whether it's uh, riding camels in Egypt or riding a motorcycle across uh, Colorado. So in life then, what does math have to do with our daily life? And in the 43 years I've been circling uh, the sun, um, basically I've learned some real common sense things like not spending what you don't have and the only way to know that is the budget and it took me a lot of years to figure that out so I'll pass that on to you while you're still young that it's a great idea to get a handle on budget and uh, cost of debt and credit cards and compounding interest and all these things that sound so complicated but they're really quite simple uh, with a little understanding of basic math um, I'm also well known in my, by my friends for having one of the lowest grocery budgets they know of. And I always tell them, hey, it's all in the per unit cost. So feel free to ask me more about that if you want as well. And yeah, sure. Hey, what does zip lines have to do with it? Go on. Tweet me that one. Okay. So my friends, some of you, perhaps like me, uh, we're very good at math, uh, certain kinds of math along the way, and perhaps devastatingly bad at others. But uh, if you're good at math, I'm going to ask you to shine on about it because 
my very favorite quote is from Mar Marianne Williamson, and it says that our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate, it's that we're powerful beyond measure, and it's our light, not our darkness, that frightens us most. So jumping further into the quote, it says there's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We're all meant to shine, and as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. So don't do what I did back in uh, the early years and pretend that, haha, I don't get math. It's really quite cool to be good at math, and it brings you amazing places in life. So for the good at math, shine on and show others you're good at math and help them with math as well. For those that aren't so good at math, hey, we all have those snakes in life that we're not real friendly with, but for the lactose intolerant, there's something called lactate. And for the math intolerant, I challenge you to find your math aid. For me, it was understanding why I needed it um, and because I had to prove a certain high school teacher wrong, who told me I'd never go anywhere in math. Uh, <laughs> I didn't. Um, but basically, if you're not good at math, always ask to the end of that sentence, not yet. Because uh, as this meme I found online says, the difference between a master and a beginner is that the master failed more times than the beginner has even tried. So there's hope for all of us. We can grab a hold of those things in life, like math, that um, might terrify us, and we can control them instead of letting them control us. So with that said, now that you know a little bit about me and my background, I'll just say keep calm and math on, and by all means, stay in touch. Uh, I'm on the web, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram. And I'm happy to also come to schools and talk to you about the power of words or math or the evils of marketing. So uh, with that said, why don't we open it up to questions? So over to you, Scott. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, great. Thanks a lot, Nadine. Uh, that was very, very interesting. Good start. Um, I'll start us off with some questions of my own um, while we wait for some to come over through Twitter. Uh, so in your presentation, you mentioned break-even analysis and um, the concept of percent change as it relates to uh, self-publishing. Can you tell us a bit more about those two ideas? Sure. Uh, so I wrote this book for the TV Celebrity Man Tracker, and we got this great, well, great offer from a Canadian publisher. And they asked us uh, if we'd be happy to sign a contract with uh, where we've received 10% of the cover value. So that sounds okay, but I started wondering if we could make more just by self-publishing. So break-even analysis is basically a set of calculations so that you can figure out how many books you'd have to sell to hit a certain target. And so basically, uh, I figured out that I'd only have to sell uh, around 7,500 books to make the same amount that uh, I would make to the publisher if we had a decent run with the publisher, and that the publisher would have had to sell 50,000 books. So I'm pretty good at marketing, this whole web guru thing. and. Uh, we ended up self-publishing and sold more than 7,500 books, broke the break-even analysis, and um, math really made the right decision for me there. Okay. Um, so would you say that um, in your use of math, would it be any different in marketing online than, say, marketing elsewhere, is that, or is it the same sort of math principles at work there? Uh, it's the same management concept of always um, measuring something to make sure that you're actually achieving your target. So it's that old management adage, you can't manage what you don't measure. Um, online just makes it a little bit different.
different because there's really measurable things. Like every time you click that mouse to go to a new page, you are doing a certain action that's captured by Google or whatever you're using. And um, so the only difference between using maps for online versus offline is that um, it's more measurable and easily. So people can, your campaigns can be more, uh, you can more easily say they're a success based on those numbers. Right. Um, you also asked me about um, percent change. And um, recently we had uh, some city councillors that were going through some budget deliberations and, um, well, it turned out that some of their numbers were wrong. And I had to actually explain how to calculate percent change to uh, some adults. And I thought, you know what? I know the kids would know how to do this in school. And I bet the people listening know how to do their percent change. And they're sitting there going, yeah, yeah. It's B minus A over A times a hundred. Come on! But uh, you know, sometimes you're in school and you sit there and you think, when am I ever going to use this? But if you you look at me, maybe you don't want to go into being a professor. Cool. You don't. You don't. I need math for that. But or maybe you're thinking, I don't need to do math. I'm going to be a writer. Well, look at me. I ended up a writer and I used math to decide on whether that publishing deal was a good one or not. And um, there's just so many ways we use math every day that it's better to grab a hold of that snake, you know, uh, <laughs> that terrifying snake for some people, and um, use it to basically squeeze every drop of fun out of life so that you can travel the world if that's your thing or if you can save up for some fancy new car if that's your thing right right yeah there's so much you can do um i noticed too that you you mentioned you've had all these these different adventures um in one of your slides you had the the fun picture of the zip lines and you uh you told me to to ask you about that so i, I can't can't resist what was it about the zip lines that you wanted wanted us to hear awesome yeah, so that slide says, what's Pythagoras got to do with it? And I got to admit, back in the day, I sat there going, why do I have to know that A squared plus B squared equals C squared? And, or base squared times height squared equals hypotenuse squared, however you're learning it. But um, I've got two children, and Scott, we wanted to put up a zip line for them. And so the question became, how much zip line do we buy? And wow, wasn't I sitting there actually doing A squared plus B squared equals C squared and then square root of C to try and figure out that exact thing. So um, it's amazing how many formulae from way many years ago, I won't even say how many years, come back and become really relevant in super fun ways later on. So, yeah, Pythagoras has got all kinds of things to do with uh, life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you're also, uh, you also teach at Algoma University. Um, was it your interest in, in math that got you involved in teaching business and economics? Uh, no. Really, it wasn't. I, uh, I started off mainly teaching uh, introductory business classes. And um, what I found, though, was that they gave me a first-year accounting course to teach. And I really enjoyed it. It was uh, so tough to get the material across in a way that people weren't terrified as soon as I showed a strange formula. And I realized it was kind of like that math aid thing I was talking about and that um, finding, your, finding your own way to connect with math because we all have different ways of connecting. 
And for me, it had to do with applicability and uh, how could math affect my life. And I would challenge anyone to say how math doesn't affect their lives um, because it really is something we have to use on a daily basis, like even going into the grocery store. Um, so it, it actually wasn't math that got me interested in teaching, but it was math that got me, um, that challenged me to try and find ways to make it more accessible to students because I think that for some reason it's been okay to say I'm no good at math and I don't think that is okay. It's just that you're not good at math yet. You can be great at math and um, it can only help you in life. So, yeah. Cool, cool. Um, so for so for all the students out there, um, and, and you just mentioned like even simple things like going to the grocery store and you know watching how much you spend on food every week. Um, what sort of tips and, and basic advice would you have for students that are maybe creating a budget for the first time? Um, we'll we'll deal with the grocery store one first. Sure. That's that's a great starting spot. So for the grocery stores, I'm not sure how many of you go shopping, but would you think that the five pack of Kleenex is going to be cheaper than the, or better value, I should say, than the one pack of Kleenex? And I wish I could say show of hands how many people think it's this one, how many people think it's that one, but since we can't do that, uh, I'll just tell you from experience, most of my students always say, well, the five pack is definitely going to be cheaper. And uh, unfortunately, that's not always true. And it's not because of marketers like me. It's because of other bad marketers who uh, decide that they're going to price their product a certain way. And if you work out the unit cost for the price per box of Kleenex, uh, and sometimes it's even shown in the label, you'll see that that unit cost, um, at least in the example in my slides, was cheaper for the five pack. I'll just open up that slide just to show you all the, all this here. Okay, so. Did it come through okay, Scott, again? Yes, it did, yeah. Okay. So in this example here, if uh, you look at the yellow, uh, it gives you the price of a five-pack versus a one-pack. And then if you look so over on the left-hand side in the red area, there's something called the unit price. And so that's your price per box of Kleenex. And you can actually see that it's a dollar sixty-eight per box for whatever it is, the five pack or three pack. I can't read it. Um, but down below, the single pack is only a dollar thirty-two. So why would you ever buy the more expensive, uh, larger size? You're not saving money. You're actually spending more for it. So my friends are always amazed that I can keep such a low grocery bill and. Just looking at something simple like for unit costs is one way to do that. Cool, cool. Um, you also have, uh, and I think you mentioned this too briefly, you also have a, a blog um, that you write. Um, is there any, so obviously the goal there is to draw as many, I assume, is to draw as many uh, readers as possible. Do, do you use the same techniques as you do with, with your books, say, for that, or is it a different technique again? Um, well, there, it's, it's actually a list of all my old columns online. Okay. So I'm not actually um, moderating traffic too much, but you're, you're right. If I were, I'd be trying to sell ads on my website, which is what a lot of bloggers do. And uh, a lot of even youth 
bloggers do. They uh, set up a website, and maybe some of you out there have your own blog. And if you start increasing traffic, you can sell ads on it and make money on the side. And um, so you, again, would have to decide. Uh, you wouldn't be deciding this part, but the people who would be buying ads on your site would be deciding how to buy them. And they would be doing that based on this concept of, am I going to pay every time someone clicks on the ad? In which case, you're paying a lot more. Like people will pay anywhere from, it could be 25 cents up to $25 every time they click on a particular link. Or um, you could just have that ad come up on the page as many times as you want for the number of views. Um, that you've paid for. And that's what we call an awareness strategy. So that's the awareness um, part of it versus the uh, actual action part of it, which is your pay per click. Okay. And, and that all happens through some platforms such as uh, Facebook? Is that how that works? Or like? Um, well, you can set up your blog or website on any type of platform. Okay. And then um, if you're using something like Google Analytics, then you can place ad blocks on your website. Um, right. I don't want to bore people to tears <laughs> with uh, Internet Marketing 101 here. But, yeah, you could do the same thing on Facebook as well. You know those annoying little ads you get down the side of your page on Facebook all the time. It's uh, the same concept. You, you People have paid for those, and they pay for them in one of two ways. Okay. Um, just one more thing here. How, how about like in the, the synergy, so you have so many things going on. You have your your, your marketing, you have your, your writing, you have your teaching. Uh, are there any strategies you've come up with to, to work on time management skills? and trying to keep all those things straight and you know there's this great uh demo that i used to do uh that i saw someone else do years before where you take a jar and in that jar um you put a bunch of golf balls and then on top of the golf balls you put some smaller pebbles and then on top of that you pour a bunch of sand in on top of that. And then you could take a cup of coffee and pour it in on top. And if you do that, everything can fit in the jar. But if you reverse the order and you start with the sand and then the smaller rock and then the golf ball, it won't all fit. So basically the moral of all that is that you've got to start with the important things first. So if you've got big projects due, or you've got big deadlines, you've got to focus on those first, and you call those your golf ball, and you get those done first. And then you focus on some of the smaller items that are coming up but a little further out. And then you focus on the sand, which is usually checking your Facebook and emails and texting everybody but you can't start with the fan, and that's the big thing. You just you got to start with those golf ball big priorities first, and then people usually ask, yeah, but what about the cup of coffee? What does that mean? And, well, the cup of coffee means that you always have time for a cup of coffee with friends or family. So you can make it all happen. Sometimes it means a few less hours sleep a night, but it's all doable, and um, for the most part, you can do it with a smile. Perfect, perfect. Well, that's uh, that's great. I've uh, certainly learned a lot. I had a lot of fun today. Um, we're pretty much out of time, though, uh, so I'd like to say thank you to everyone that tuned into the stream online. And of course to you, Dr. Robinson, for taking the time to share your expertise and answer our, our questions today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for your time. And uh, this uh, was my first. So if this is not what you're used to, I did my best. Yeah, no, it was perfect. I'll just give a, a quick uh, promo for, for next week's uh, live event. 
uh, which takes place on World Health Day, uh, Thursday, April 7th. Uh, at that time, we'll answer your questions about diabetes with Dr. Jan Hux, who is the Chief Science Officer at the Canadian Diabetes Association. So we look forward to that. Um, for today, though, again, thank you again, Dr. Robinson, and thank you again to all of our viewers. Thanks, Bye. Scott. Bye for now.